Quantum computing is built on the ideas of giants. These so-called quantum foundations contain some complicated concepts, including entanglement. The 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to three scientists who expanded our understanding of entanglement. Learn how this invisible link works and explore some other fascinating core ideas behind quantum information science in this episode of The Post-Quantum World. I'm your host, Konstantinos Kragianis. I lead Quantum Computing Services at Protivity, where we're helping companies prepare for the benefits and threats of this exploding field. I hope you'll join each episode as we explore the technology and business impacts of this post-quantum era. Our guest today is the Chief Scientist at Quantinium, uh, Bob Kuka. Welcome to the show. Hello. Yeah, I'm really glad to have you on. Uh, this is going to be a, a different kind of episode. We're going to touch a little bit of, on um, some fundamentals in, in physics, basically, or you use a different term for it, uh, quantum <laughs> foundations, and we'll get to that. Um, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about entanglement. Uh, but before we get to all that spooky stuff, um, I figured it'd be fun to just tell our listeners a little bit about how you ended up at Quantinium, what, what your quantum journey has been like. So, yeah, like a lot... I mean, I recently posted a blog post and I kind of go a little bit into history there. So I myself, I started my PhD, in what's called Quantum Foundations, which is a field started by Einstein, Schrodinger, von Neumann to, to put on some names, some names where they really wanted to go through the core of quantum mechanics. What is quantum mechanics really telling us about the world in which we live? Uh, which is in contrast to how quantum mechanics was taught when I was at university. It was basically thought as a bunch of cooking recipes. Literally, they use those words. These are the recipes. This is what you do. And you don't think about it. You don't think about it. You don't ask questions. You just do it. It was like, like, like an accountant. He was some sort of form of accountancy. So nonetheless, the, the fathers of the field, with Einstein and, and Schrodinger and von Neumann, they were very busy before it actually uh, meant. And a lot, lots of uh, people are... St- when they start studying and they hear about that field, they get naturally attracted to it. Some of the best best scientists and people who are more creative are very attracted to that field. But then when I was doing my uh, PhD in that field, what I didn't know uh, until the end of my PhDs, it was impossible to get any job in that field at that time. And I'm talking mid nineties. It was not a matter that I couldn't get like a postdoc or there was not a single one uh, anywhere. And uh, so I ended up, Unemployed, I had a reasonably good publication record, although you couldn't get that stuff published in the top journals, of course. Uh, And so kind of reinvented myself as a mathematician uh, in the fields of category theory which and uh, logic. So as a category theory and logician. And uh, I had a bit of luck. I was in Belgium at a time with the political constellation that the people that one of the people who was awarding fellowships, like in France, CNRS, was a category theoretician. So he really liked the fact that a physicist was going to try to get into category theory. And he pushed me hard. So I actually got a postdoc fellowship then. But then again, after that, uh, the constellation changes and it was was again finished. And uh, I actually then ended up applying for things like jobs at art schools and because I was also an artist. I really didn't believe there was any hope for me. And then out of the blue, I didn't apply for it. I got a, a job offer from Oxford Computer Science because uh, they're, they're the, computer, the computer scientists, especially Samson Abramsky, who were doing logic, they had found that in a certain part of logic, you naturally, naturally get Hilbert space, so quantum mechanical models for the logic. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were very interested to see whether whatever they had been doing was ever apl- applicable to physics and quantum computing even. So I just got hunt- hunted for that job. I uh, stayed at Oxford for 20 years, became a full professor there, built a group of some 50 people. And then when my stuff was start to become used by companies like IBM and Google, I thought it's good to connect with industry myself. And then I got an offer, which I couldn't refuse uh, because we really needed for the things I wanted to develop at the time. We really, well, now, uh, starting two years ago, it, it was completely impossible to do this in academia. Totally impossible for many reasons. Yeah, we owe we owe a lot. The field owes a lot to Oxford in general. There's quite a few people there who've contributed to it heavily, um, and uh, including one guest I'd love to have on the show, David Deutsch, one day. <laughs> um, so, 
let's talk a little bit about some of these foundations. Uh, um, would you say that you ended up working a little bit with interpretations of quantum mechanics back then? Well, my, well? my PhD was 100% on interpretations, uh, but it was even too far ahead of its time. Because, at, I mean, so the physics world really didn't want to have anything to do with quantum foundations. There, there was a slogan, a slogan going around, shut up and calculate, and people doing quantum foundations were either considered as crackpots or people only interested in philosophy and, 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 and nothing else. Uh, and and then, then what the people in philosophy were mainly doing in quantum foundations was fighting each other over interpretations. And, and these fights are still going on. <laughs> and, <laughs> but I mean, nobody really takes notice anymore. That, that's the big difference. But it was really a very bad climate. People were not sort of career-minded, uh, communication minded. It was all about like my interpretation and against the others. And and there were like it was like like you got in the UK two political parties or something like that. You had sort of four or five official interpretations and you had to pick one of them. So I actually ended up working it in something which was on something that was not part of those five. <laughs> and oh, so then, okay. then, you, then you didn't exist at all. Then you didn't <laughs> exist at all. Uh, uh, yeah, people have gotten in trouble with interpretations. I so mean, to, you know. <laughs> to be more concrete, there is something which is called a uh, Bo Bohmian interpretation, which is an interpretation with hidden variables. So where you assign extra value, variables to the state of the system. And uh, this is, by the way, very closely related to this year's no Nobel Prize. Yeah. So you, you, you assign states to the extra variables to the state of the vi system, but you can only do this if they are non-local. So to say, and basically the Nobel Prize this year was for the experimental demonstration, and also some theoretical work towards this uh, proof of quantum non-locality, because that's really what it is, like the non-existence of classical probabilistic descriptions for quantum mechanics. So you have to go non-local if you do want to do any, anything like that. So Bohm is an example of such a theory, and that's one where people want to put the variables, one still wants to sort of think that the state is just there and that everything you learn in a quantum measurement is about that state. So the variables are assigned to the state. Now, what I was working on is where the variables are assigned to the interaction of the state with its, measure, with, with its environment, which is a measurement device. So, but that was the idea that, that which brings sort of subjective factor into physics, like the state, it's not just all about the state, it's also when you put the state in contact with its environment. And that was complete taboo. That was complete taboo at the time. <laughs> and now I know big people like Carlo Rovelli and all that, they're actually moving in that direction now, like 30 years later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and the, the, he's writing some pretty great books too, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're making yeah, it I'm more accessible. Very, I'm, I'm with, with Rovelli, we have a big project where we actually look, uh, use using foundational stuff in quantum, like towards quantum gravity. Like we have a very nice project going on already for, we have, we have three years now, another three years at Templeton, multi, multi million project. So that's really nice. Nice. And um, going back to that. So how would your, how did your work um, challenge the Einstein Podolsky Rosen paper, the famous EPR paper where Einstein brought up the hidden variable idea? I mean, I mean, it, it's, it's, perfectly comparable with, with all the previous results, of course. It's just a view where you can... So that, this is what I did in my PhD and then nothing anymore mm -hmm. because it okay, yeah. wasn't very fruitful. But uh, and uh, this is an idea which actually goes back to, to an old paper by Nicolas Gisin and uh, Constantin Piron, which they come up with an, an equation for measurement by, model, by taking a variable which is in the measurement device which is associated to the measurement device and sort of moves with the symmetries of the measurement device rather than with the symmetries of the system. And, and pe but people didn't realize that that's what they were doing. Otherwise, they would have rejected that work. But that jack work got actually well received. Once you start saying what it actually is, that it's an invaluable theory, with, like where some of your variables are associated to the environment rather than to the system. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, anyway. Before so, so, we, but, but what I then to go now, I'm going to your question more directly. So, with this discovery, like APR, and then it was actually mainly Schrödinger who coined like this idea of entanglement. Mm -hmm. uh, I started to sort of embrace the idea that the most important thing in quantum mechanics, mechanics is what happens if you compose two systems, if you bring them together. I wasn't aware at the time, but that's something Schrodinger had proposed in 1935 and was never picked up by anybody. 
And in that paper, he actually was already laying the foundations of quantum computing because he came up with something which is called quantum steering. And that very much goes in the direction of quantum teleportation. The quantum teleportation really is itself a computational model. Uh, but so, so the historical context there was, uh, so John van Neumann had written the book with the Hilbert space formalism of quantum mechanics, which is the standard formalism of quantum mechanics, was published in 1932. And then in 1935, von Neumann himself rejected his own formalism. Of course, most people are still using it, and it's still what, how, the way quantum mechanics is taught, but von Neumann rejected it on conceptual grounds. He said, this doesn't feel right, this doesn't feel like a theory of physics, how it should, should be. And then there are things in quantum mechanics like redundancies, when you, when you want to associate a vector to a system, you can do this in multiple ways, which are equivalent, which, which sort of makes your, gives your theory a bad feel. So now what von Neumann sort of fundamentally felt was we should start with like the cons. I mean, he was also a logician. We should start by assigning some logical structure to quantum mechanics, which really focuses on how quantum is different from classical. And he focused mainly... On the, on the concept of measurement. So how observation, the fact that the system changes and all that, changes like the way we can assign logical properties to a system. And that was called quantum logic. And then that, that was a field which was very active for a very long time, but kind of died out in the 80s and especially in the 90s because there was a few failures. They were never able to, at a conceptual level, uh, describe how two quantum systems compose. So they were always talking about single systems. And it's actually, I didn't know the Schrodinger thing, but I knew this fact, the complete failure of that area of research to describe composite systems. And then I thought, let's do the opposite. Let's start with composite systems and see where we get. And that was, a, I mean, I, I had a few failed attempts. And then when I was at Oxford with Samson Abramsky, who's a very famous computer scientist, we actually started what's called categorical quantum mechanics. And that's, so, that's been a success story. I mean, it, had, it needed its time, but that was a success story. And the idea is that your, your main symbol is basically putting two systems together. And then we have shown that all of quantum mechanics can just be formulated in those terms. And measurement emerges from it. So the measurement is actually a consequence of composition, not the other ways around. So Schrodinger's intu intuition was very right. And for Norman was wrong, which is a really weird thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> but I should say all the attempts that Van Neumann had to actually come up with a new quantum mechanics formalism were failures in, uh, for that purpose. But they each uh, generated an entirely new field of mathematics. <laughs> so they were pretty successful in a way. So to help our listeners, um, I was wondering if you wanted to give a, a good, concise um, explanation about what entanglement really is. Entanglement is the, is the fact when you got two systems and you bring them together that new forms emerge of, of their being. So normally, traditionally, we have the idea that when we describe two systems, you just describe one and then the other. You, in the case of quantum mechanics, that's not enough, typically. These situations also exist, but they're like a limit case. It's very uncommon. Typically, what you have is a situation where the two become some, some one whole. And I can use a good metaphor there, for example, the concept of a twin. So if I tell you, okay, consider a twin, then I can ask you, like, like let's well, call them like uh, uh, Alice and, 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 and Claire. And then I ask, well, how does Alice look like? You know nothing about Alice. You know nothing about Alice. But the thing you know is, however Alice looks like, maybe she has blonde hair, then Claire will also have blonde hair. If Alice is tall, then Claire will be tall, and so on. But you actually know nothing about Alice. And this is, a, this is, this is kind of analogous to what's called uh, the EPR state or the Bell state, which is so, the most prototypical uh, entangled state. Now, what you can do with these things through a, a concept like quantum teleportation, you can in some way use these um, new states as channels. It's as if there is some sort of bridge from Alice to Claire through which things can flow. And uh, it, it, it's subtle, it's quite subtle how this all works, but that, that's the idea and that's entanglement. 
Yeah, Einstein didn't really love that, I guess, because of its non-local nature. Well, um, yeah, and that, that was the problem. So non-locality itself is a very subtle thing. Like I make a disclaimer, you can't use this to send. It's not like as information, like mm-hmm. messages. You can't use this to, but whatever happens at one side impacts what happens at the other side. So it's a very subtle thing, quantum non-locality. It's a very subtle thing. Yeah, and and people always talk about the spooky action at a distance thing. And and actually Einstein, it turns out, wasn't talking about entanglement. He was talking about when the observation is made. That was the spooky action, the collapse of the wave yeah. function, whatever you want to call it. Yes, yeah, but I mean, but there, 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 is, there is no real action. There's no action going on, really. So, so a lot yeah. of people have started screaming against uh, all these spooky actions at a distance being mentioned after the Nobel Prize. I mean, it's not such a bad crime, but it's... Uh, it's it's quite subtle. One has to be careful with these things because otherwise, one is violating Einstein's theory, theory of relativity, and that's of course why Einstein uh, got a little bit annoyed. So it's almost like under the hood, maybe there is some signaling, but we can't, we don't have access to it. We can't manipulate it that's, or use it. That, that's kind of what. Yeah. That's that's an image which I have. So so I tell people like yes, you're. It seems like you're sending information faster than the speed of light, but in reality, it's random. It's not, you know, you can't send bits that way. You're just you, can, you, you can't you can't send anything. Like 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 one thing you can do, and that's what teleportation does, is for example sending infinite infinite data, like infinite data using finite means. So it's more like an amplifier. Mm-hmm. So you send a few things, and suddenly the other side receives like this huge message, but but you actually only have to send a few bits. So that's really what the quantum teleportation is. Yeah, with teleportation, you're you're using these principles in a way to transfer a quantum state, but you have to have a classical channel to set up that. Exactly, path. and that's that's where these few bits travel. Yeah, and uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, the, the thing is we're talking teleportation, so this actually takes us to to the beginnings of quantum uh, categorical quantum mechanics. So we were able, using composition alone, to give like a very uh, generic description of quantum teleportation. Basically, in this new form, little quantum te- teleportation was the most trivial thing you could imagine. In the old formalism, the Hilbert space formalism, it took six people 60 years. So to, it took 60 years and then six people to come up with it. So, so that's why when we first started this category of quantum mechanics, there was something clearly very promising about it because it was conceptually simple. And then another thing is, this, this is a particular branch of category theory, which is equivalent to just drawing pictures. So mm-hmm. ultimately, what we had was the start of a purely pictorial quantum formalism. I mean, we didn't know, I didn't know at the time that this was even possible to get all of quantum mechanics pictorially, but we know, now know that you can actually. All of quantum theory can, can fully be formalized pictorially because these pictures are really the incarnation of the idea that it's all about composition. I mean, it's it's now a spoken thing. I can't show pictures. Yeah. The, 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 the most ab- absurd thing is to talk about pictures because pictures are supposed to be seen. But <laughs> Yeah, and, and listeners should know that you pulled it off because in about a month or so or um, after this airs, your book, Quantum and Pictures, will be coming out. And uh, I got to see a digital advanced copy. Uh, of that. They, okay, and, that's, that's yeah, good. Yeah, it, it's, it's pretty clear. I mean, you go through and, and it's and it's even got like a handwriting font. So the whole thing feels like you just sat there and sketched it out um, and you're talking to the reader. So it took I think people years. are going to like it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it yeah. took 20 years. To <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, but, but it does look like the kind of book that you'd want to hand to someone who's super lost and, and doesn't understand what's going on. So I'm looking forward to seeing a paper copy. Um, now, when we talk about these uh, principles like like entanglement and teleportation, it, it's one of those things that people hear about all the time with quantum computing. They they hear it, they recognize it, and then they know it has something to do with it, but they don't really get what it has to do with it. Um, so I wonder if you want to explain something very basic. Like, for example, uh, you hear that with, with qubits, it's two to the n. That's how many states of information you can represent, right? So, um, you know, you can represent uh, 4, 8, 16, 32, all the states of information by adding qubits. And this is because those are perfectly entangled qubits. Uh, so I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about how qubit entanglement works. It's, again, a subtle thing in the sense that it depends what you call represent information. If mm-hmm. you're looking at the number of states, the number of states that you have, well, it's already infinite from the start for a single qubit. There yeah, are well, infinite yeah. states. But if you're then gonna gonna start talking on how much can I read, 
Mm -hmm. read out of the states with certainty, then it's exactly the numbers you said. Now, it doesn't mean that, that that's, only, that's all you have, because under the hood you can play a, a lot of games, like in this continuous space, to actually do very special things anyway, even though you, you don't really have the access. And so, so, that, so that's one aspect of quantum computing, the fact that you have this continuous space. The other one which you mentioned is, is, is in particular the entanglement that while typically uh, dim dimensions classically would just, uh, you, you have a bit and then you have an under bit, you got four and then you got a cube, you have eight. Here you got sort of an exponential blow up under the hood of the size of the space. Mm -hmm. Now that causes problems. That causes a lot of problems. For example, in chemistry, uh, which is where, where, where uh, uh, molecules have quantum mechanical descriptions, a simple molecule like coffee, coffee is a very simple thing, uh, you can't compute, and it's not, the theory of coffee is completely known. It's completely known. Every detail we know of, how, to, how we principle to calculate this, but we can't do this with any existing computer because of this exponential blow up of the space. When you start putting quantum systems together, you got an exponential blow up of the size of space. And so it was said that if you want to compute anything about these things efficiently, you need a quantum computer. So that's an old, an old idea going back to Feynman in, in, yeah, in the early 1981, 80s. yep. Oh, yeah. Uh, he was concerned with having a simulator, a, a simulator yes. in the physical yeah, yeah, universe. Yeah, so, so you are simulated. Now, and I think, so, and, and there was a belief, there was a belief until uh, recently that simulation was just about quantum systems. Now, during the development of this pictorial theory of quantum quantum mechanics, we actually realized that this theory wasn't just only useful for quantum mechanics. Uh, we realized that there was an open problem in a completely different area, nat natural language processing, which is a uh, well all, all the sort of systems you use involving natural language, web web search, translation, which is automatic. That's natural language processing, or AI. AI. A lot of AI today is natural language processing, mm -hmm. and there was a, there was an open problem in natural language processing, which is somewhat surprising that nobody had addressed it. It's like um, we we I mean we we pe so if you got on the one hand meaning of words and the other hand grammatical structure of sentences, then we as humans we know how they work together, because if I tell you a, a, a sentence with words you know, and it's grammatical, but you never hear the sentence before, then you do know what I mean. So you, you're able to sort of take these words, put them together using the grammar, and extract the meaning of a sentence. So there was no, the, the mathematics of for doing that was not known. There was no theory which described that. And then I was giving a talk in uh, 2005 when, when I first had my graphical description of teleportation. And in, in the audience, this was a McGill in Montreal, was a very famous linguist. Uh, Jim Lombeck. He, in the 50s, he came up with a mathematical theory of grammar. And when I started to describe teleportation, he said, hey, Bob, this is grammar. I said, no, this is physics, quantum physics. No, this is grammar. So he actually realized that exactly the same formalism, the teleportation stuff, was, 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 was a representation of his latest theory of grammar. And so <laughs> we basically, what we had with quantum mechanics was a solution to the problem of how to combine meaning and uh, grammar, because these days meaning is rep represented by vectors. Like we have, a, you have all these vector embeddings, like a GPT-3 and all these things, and that's all based on meaning as vectors. And so we had a formulas where you got vectors flowing into the wires, and the wires representing grammar. And so this is now what I mainly do with my team at Continuum in Oxford is quantum natural language processing, because we got a quantum formalism for combining meaning and grammar. It really also wants to live on a quantum computer. And that's something we've been doing now since 2000 on actual quantum computers. So, so it, it's a miracle that this is now possible on a quantum computer, sort of natural language process. And it's thanks to this graphical formalism. So that, that's an interesting. Okay. Uh, so so you're, are you hoping to expand that and do a lot of other QML type of applications based on your work? Then? Well, I mean, I want to emphasize this is not QML per se. Okay. Because what, what quantum machine learning really is, is you take traditional machine learning and you try, try to quantum enhance this. Mm -hmm. This is not what we do. We have an entirely new approach to natural language processing than which people usually use in machine learning. Uh, so 
we, we give a lot of structure. There is a lot of structure going on, while usually machine learning is like structure. Uh, it, it doesn't understand any structure. It doesn't understand any grammar. Everything has to be learned from data. And if you would try to do natural language processing on a quantum computer, now totally impossible in that way, only data driven. It's because we got this structure, which was the grammar and actually a lot more these days. And we, we use it explicitly that we are actually able to do something like that. Now, this structure itself, just like the quantum entanglements, is exponentially expensive. So you can't expect to do this efficiently on a classical machine, ever. Okay. So, so it's an example of where you want to do something on a quantum computer, but it's not quantum substance. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's why I asked if, if you were going to try and expand it to, to something different, but it sounds like... We, we're expanding <laughs> it to, no, to, to general... We're not trying to expand it to general... I don't like the word artificial intelligence. We call it compositional intelligence. I don't like artificial because, I mean, not, intelligence doesn't have to be artificial. It can be just intelligence. And uh, <laughs> secondly, I, I, we want to give this constructive word of compositional because it's, you know, it started all with this composing of Schrödinger and these pictures are representations of compositions. And you see the analogy with uh, language where you compose words together to form sentences too. And these words are, of course, highly entangled with each other, too, because otherwise they wouldn't communicate to each other. And, and, and it would just be a bag of words, which is just the sum of the meanings. And that's not what a sentence is. It's not just the sum of the meanings of the words inside. Okay. Well, that sounds like a really interesting approach. Um, so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the Nobel Prize this year. So, so if you look at the last 10 years, uh, in 2012, it was Serge Hiroche and David Weinland. They, their, their Nobel Prize was related to quantum computing. And uh, that's about when I got involved in quantum computing. Uh -huh. and, uh, and now here I am 10 years later, once again, we have a Nobel Prize that's really directly related to quantum computing. Um, so I wanna, wonder if you want to talk a little bit about the impact. So I don't think that, that the connotation of quantum computing was given to the Arosh one. They, it, it wasn't really put forward like that. And this one, I wouldn't say is a, is a Nobel Prize in quantum computing, but it's a Nobel Prize in quantum foundations. At the time that these people were doing that work, they didn't have computing in mind whatsoever. What they had in mind was basically showing what I said, that there are no hidden variable theories which are non-local, which are local. That was what they've been trying to prove over these years, starting with our APR paper, showing it all the way through. Uh, and then, I mean, I know Zeilinger very well, very well, he's a friend. And this, this, is, he's, this is a quantum foundation per, person in heart and soul. And in the 19s, that was really the only real quantum foundations group in the world which was sort of sustainable just because of his stature and because they were doing experiments, because they were doing experiments on, on, on these things. I mean, so yeah, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I was actually officially the first quantum foundations professor in the world, and this was in 2006, 2007, so quite late, quite late. And then the second one was somebody in Zeilinger's group, not surprisingly, Shazlav Bruckner. Uh, I mean, it's Shazlav who told me that I was the first because he was proud to be the second. <laughs> well, yeah. The, so the 2012 prize, um, the, the Wineland component, he, he, that, that's the work that led to trapped ion quantum computing, basically. Sure, sure, sure. So sure, that's, sure. What, that's what I meant, why that's, sure, sure, that sure. kicked it off. And now with entanglement, as, we, as we've said, it's a very major part of how quantum computers work, you know. So, so proving it's... It, uh, of course. But, so the point I'm trying to make is like so much quantum computing, I've got lots of examples, came out of quantum foundations. Mm -hmm. of people doing something foundational, and, he, and, and if they're spot on, then the application automatically follows. I'm a person who believes that if you go very foundational, that you're going to get actually a lot more applications than if you start with applications. So if you, you, do, you do the groundwork properly. Now, a lot of people have done wrong groundwork, especially this, this argumentation on these interpretations was mostly, as it doesn't have led too much, but you mentioned David Deutsch, and it did inspire David Deutsch to come up with like his quantum algorithm. So David Deutsch is a many world person. Yeah. And he said, if you've got many I worlds. I am too. <laughs> you, you know, okay. yeah. If you've got many worlds, then, I mean, so you know the Deutsch story, then then maybe these, these many computations can take place at the same time in all these worlds and maybe we can mm -hmm. get an advantage out of it. That was his first intuition about, uh, about a quantum interpretation. Uh, but I mean, I don't think that much more later has come out of this, uh, this particular branch. 
uh, like the teleportation very much came out of Schrodinger's steering and Schrodinger, Schrodinger came up with steering to sort of show what entanglement possibly could do and that the world is a different place. But he was again, not thinking about computing, of course. Mm -hmm. This was oh, not yeah, something yeah. that was in the in the mind. And what the work would, which I've been doing, and then in particular, the using quantum computing, like the, graph, the, the graphical formalism, pictorial formalism, this came out of trying to come up with a new formalism of quantum mechanics, going back all the way to the Neumann. So, like I said, I was, uh, this, this is what I grew up with, even as a PhD student, and what I wanted to work on, really, like coming up with a new quantum formalism. That, that was always sort of my main focus. The, the hidden variable stuff was kind of a deviation. It happened to be something my supervisor told me I should do for my PhD. I really wanted to sort of uh, go into this new formalism stuff. And I started I started in this area of quantum logic and gradually bringing in more category theory and, and, and composition of state systems, making it, trying to make it explicit and things like that. And now, now these diagrams are, I mean, I've got a slide in, of all the quantum companies who are now using my diagram for some practical purpose. And this is like a slide with many different categories. And you've got like 30, 40 companies I'm aware of quant for quantum activity are now using that. So an example is like a, a error correction uh, very much a lattice surgery at Google. So they're, they're quite active in that. Mm -hmm. uh, IBM is 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 do, is do is very much also engaged in using it for education and, and things like that. And they have like two themes. I discovered, I discovered, I wasn't aware, two teams working on this quantum natural language processing I mentioned. mentioned. Uh, Friday, they will bring a blog post about uh, quantum natural language processing and what they've done following up on our work. So Friday, I give a Kiskit seminar specifically about that this Friday. I don't know when the... But, Maybe, oh, yeah, this... <laughs> the, 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 maybe the, <laughs> the podcast comes later, but anyway. Yeah, it'll just be like within a couple of weeks after. Um, so yeah, so, yeah, but that so I'll put a link know. to your blog. This talk, this talk, this talk will be out, and the blog post will be out there then uh, by IBM. And there's so many other examples, like all the all the photonic quantum computing companies I'm aware of, like Mandela and Psi Quantum, for example. They're all using this diagram uh, to understand compilation from typical quantum circuits to the sort of photonic layers, where which, which which look very different than qubits. In fact, like if you encode, if you try to build a quantum computer with light, your bottom architectures look looks very different from qubits. And they also don't work with uh, circuits. So the way you compute is not like most existing quantum computers like IBM, uh, ours, uh, Google's. They use something which is called measurement-based quantum computing. The idea... And uh, this goes back to Hans Bregel and, and Rausendorf, but actually also back to teleportation itself. The idea that you can use observation to change systems, and ultimately that by observation only, you can actually, you have a universal computer. And this turns out to be very suitable to work with light. It's called measurement-based quantum computing. And, and of, of course, you can talk to Hans Bregel, again, a super foundational person. He came up with these ideas again, uh, from very foundational thinking about quantum mechanics and taking the collapse, which also people are still arguing about whether it really happens, taking yes. the collapse very serious, taking very serious, of course. I was going to ask you about that. Um, so with the work you're doing now and, and everything you've seen, has your view on the uh, measurement problem, on the collapse, has any of that changed? Uh, do you maybe have a different uh, interpretation these days? Uh, I mean, I mean, Pretty much all I've done is quite agnostic to which interpretation you want. Now, as we speak, I actually started writing um, or, or doing research for a paper uh, about what these pictures actually tell about the different interpretations. So we're basically coming up with pictorial representations for the interpretations. We're not done yet. We got a couple. And it gives sort of an interesting view. Some are not so pretty as others. Let's put it like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so it seems that the the compositional idea, so co that composition is really at the heart of quantum, does tell something about which interpretations are sort of more likely from that point of view than others. You can do them all. You can do them all. In principle, principally just quantum mechanics, so it's compatible with, except the ones who are being like uh, discarded now because... They don't like like the uh, what is it like the GRW stuff, which is close to being disproved. So okay, that's gone then, of course. Yeah, I'm I'm finding um, 
fascinating different interpretations of even what many worlds might mean. Like, um, you know, there was Max Tegmark's idea of many levels of um, the multiverse and his mathematical universe. And then more recently, there's been this idea of entanglement through time that, that you can uh, measure a state through time, not just like the entanglement right now, but, you know, so maybe the other worlds are just sure, five sure, minutes sure. from now or something. I don't know. Um, so all these ideas are really, really interesting. Uh, so I, I totally nerd out on that because, like I said, I, I love the idea of the of everything happening that could happen, basically. <laughs> yes, yeah. Like, uh, but anyway, my, my main point, I repeat, is that much of the much of the development is quantum computers, and the ideas came really from from thinking foundationally of quantum mechanics, rather than sort of starting and at the quantum computing with quantum computing textbook, and then say, let's see what we can do. Uh, that, yeah. that, that, that's 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 my main message. So, so what um, I guess if you want to talk a little bit about how you're hoping this will will help the field overall going forward, um, you know what what's what's moving you forward, what's kind of like holding you back right now. I mean, I mean, I don't think things are holding it back. It's 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 really how can we make the most of it for the for the future? And like I say, uh, in my own case, this quantum natural language processing. The fact that that emerged from like thinking about what should quantum language really telling us, it's it's not something you predict. It's not something you predict. And the the most difficult the most difficult progress in science is the unexpected connections you never expect, uh, new possibilities you would never expect, and 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 you need some sort of vehicle to get to them. And the vehicle is not like so just st- st- sitting there at state and the art and so look so what is the, what are the open questions now which is that which a lot of people have like a lot of scientists they, they, they have this sort of mentality of what are the open questions in the field and let's solve them and let's solve them as quickly as possible so that's a completely different approach to science than what i have i basically just think deeply about something what it means and i try to form an image and that image tells you then where you should go with it that's 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 a completely different mentality, and that's that's a little bit what artists do too. I would say more than scientists. It's sort of a more artistic view on on scientific progress, and uh, this is where the surprises really happen. This is where the surprises really happen. And so you mentioned error correction before. Um, did you uh, have any future plans that you want to share about where Quantinium is going with that? Like how, how they hope to implement that and maybe like a hint at a roadmap that might implement that? Uh, uh, I mean, the, the error correction team is not under me. Like the only error correction I'm involved in is, is really in photonic, photonic uh, architectures. Like I said, my team is directly working with Quandela and, 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 and PsyQuantum mm-hmm. uh, because the what I was explaining about the photonics, you got this different layer Mm-hmm. At the bottom, at, 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 then, then what really the quantum circuits are, you use a completely different quantum computational model with these measurements. And then there is a very sophisticated intertwining, especially with psi quantum, of the error correction with all of the previous, I'm telling. It's very interestingly intertwined with this um, measurement-based quantum computing. The, so this is Terry Rudolph who has been leading these ideas. It's mm-hmm. Schrodinger's grandson, by the way, for those people who don't know it. <laughs> and... Um, that, that's the interesting story. It's all right. And so, so this is so complicated to reason about that the diagrams are really the only way forward. And they all know it. So they start to do it themselves, Psy Quantum. Then Terry, at some point on a big motorcycle, came here to my house and then, <laughs> and then asked, for, asked for help, basically. Yeah. I had, I had Terry on this show, actually. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. He's, yeah. He, he's a close friend. He's quite a character. Yeah, he's a great guy. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed talking to him. Uh, yeah, so if you wanted to maybe give us uh, like one last thought about what um, your work is heading towards right now, what, what's the next big thing you hope to do with your? So, so, so like I kind of hinted before, one thing we were thinking we, we're really busy with is like going beyond language mm-hmm. to cognitive architecture, and uh, maybe an, 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 a new form of interpretable AI, which we call compositional intelligence. Uh, whether it is to better understand how our brains work or to better design like AI or robots things. So that, that's a big chunk of the activity of my team. So so Continuum, has, I should say, has several teams. 
I mean, I'm chief scientist, but I'm also, I also got my own team in Oxford, which is the compositional intelligence team. Mm -hmm. And that's where we really focus on this AI stuff. But at the same time, also are the heart probably in the entire world of all this diagrammatic stuff. Uh, except I should say that the head of our software team is, is Ross Duncan. And the biggest part of this graphical language is called ZX Calculus. That's something Ross and I did in 2007, 2008, sitting next to Terry on a bus in Iran. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring it together. Yeah, I remember reading about that years ago. Yeah. <laughs> the, the calculus, yeah. Um, so, yeah, thank you. I, good luck with that. I, I do have a gut feeling that one of the things that might have been missing from advance in AI is quantum. So let's see yeah. if, if that's the thing that brings it together. Because so far, no system I've seen has even come close to even being designed like the human brain works, for example, you know, like well, just exactly. conscious, and, subconscious, I mean, none of that. I think this comes back to the sort of exponential type of blow up that, that one gets when one tries to really think about these things and how they should be and and, with, and, and, and how the brain kind of works. So, so, so we've been thinking about like, how do you represent actually, how do you do spatial, how do we translate language into spatial images? Because if I'm talking to you, you don't perceive this as like black symbols on a white, on a white, background like on a line you, when i tell you something you see when i talked about terry and rose and i in the bus you probably saw a bus and the three of us sitting there <laughs> or imagine something like that so what is this process and we for example some of the the latest things i've been working on are translations of of, of like linguistic structure to like uh, spatial temporal visual structure and this is a, that's again another example of something completely unexpected what we came up with in the process an entirely new model of language which is not one dimensional like words after each other but which is two dimensional and and the amazing upshot to end with a boom is that the representation is language independent if you go, so different languages have different grammatical structures in terms of word orderings and, and, and punctuation things. So this new linguistic structure we came up with uh, by thinking about like how we think and how we translate language into images uh, makes all the language make all languages equal and also for example uh, different uh, presentations of the same meaning like many short sentences, one long sentence it just all becomes the same. So you get incredible compression of what language actually is. And so my belief is that this structure is much closer to how meaning should be represented, not just for language, but for, for in all the other ways. And so that's my belief that we are actually getting a little bit closer there to how we actually reason at a high level and represent things at a high level. Uh, there aren't many papers out of that, but uh, soon we'll have one out. But that's just oh, an I, example. I can't that's wait, a, actually. <laughs> again, an example of something completely unexpected by thinking about something foundational. We didn't say, okay, now let's let's build a two-dimensional representation of language. It wasn't like that. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to reading that, actually. Um, so maybe I'll have you back on after. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so thanks so much for coming, and, and uh, good luck with the book, which I, I'm, I'm sure everyone's going to enjoy from what I've seen. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Now it's time for Coherence, the quantum executive summary, where I take a moment to highlight some of the business impacts we discussed today in case things got too nerdy at times. Let's recap. Bob was a professor of quantum foundations at Oxford University. For many years, those fantastical sounding aspects of quantum physics that we hear about were being taught as an almost kind of philosophy. There didn't seem to be commercial use for them, but Bob saw early on at Oxford that quantum information science is a product of quantum foundations. One of the core quantum foundation mysteries is entanglement. Without entanglement, qubits could not interact with each other to provide our quantum computers with the capabilities to actually compute. Schrodinger called entanglement the characteristic feature of quantum theory, and it has that same importance in QIS. Entanglement makes it possible to bring two systems together so that they can no longer be described separately. Such entangled entities or particles can maintain this link over vast distances, too. This seemingly violates the concept of locality. If you observe one entangled particle and see it has a quantum property of being, say, spin up, you know that its entangled sibling particle is spin down. This other particle could be light years away, and the information still seems to travel instantly. Einstein was troubled by this seeming instant transfer of information that occurs when entangled particles are observed. 
famously calling the decoherence moment spooky action at a distance. In truth, such information gleaned from entanglement is purely random, so locality is never violated. Einstein's speed of light remains intact. The 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to Elaine Aspect, John Clauser, and Anton Zeilinger for their work in investigating and controlling particles in entangled states, work which QIS has greatly benefited from. Bob has been working on using quantum computers for quantum natural language processing, or QNLP, that is different from prior quantum machine learning. Quantinium's compositional intelligence team is hoping to have an impact on general AI one day. I'm looking forward to seeing what they accomplish. You can find a YouTube link to his latest talk on QNLP in the show notes. That does it for this episode. Thanks to Bob Kuka for joining to discuss Quantum Foundations and his work at Quantinium. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe to Prativity's The Post-Quantum World and maybe leave a review to help others find us. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Constant Hacker. That's Constant with a K, Hacker. You'll find links there to what we're doing in Quantum Computing Services at Prativity. You can also DM me questions or suggestions for what you'd like to hear on the show. For more information on our quantum services, Check out Prativity.com or follow Prativity Tech on Twitter and LinkedIn. Until next time, be kind and stay quantum curious. Mm -hmm.